Thank you. We're going to start it out with just me. I'm Mo. Uh, Jeremiah is going to join a little ways uh, through our time together. But you guys, it is so exciting to be back with you all. By a show of hands, who was here? I, th I think it was this time last year, right? Summer of last year when we came through last time. A couple people? Awesome. So this is kind of a continued conversation. Praise God for that. Those who are new um, or this is your first time, we just welcome you. My name is Mo. My husband, Jeremiah, our four kiddos are running around here. Um, it, is, it is truly our delight to delight in Jesus. I, I can't emphasize enough to you guys how much a life not lukewarm surrendered, a life completely surrendered to Christ is the greatest adventure. Yeah. It is an adventure. I don't know who tried to convince the church or the people coming to the church or whosoever that being a follower of Christ was boring or mundane or dry. To be filled with the fire of God and to be filled with the Holy Spirit is a great adventure. And particularly... If you have known any season or chunk or long stretch or period of life in which that was not the case, in which you did not know who Jesus was when you were not filled with the Spirit of God, to know the gift that we receive, yeah. 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 when it stands in contrast to how we lived and what we knew, it's, a, it's incredible. How could we ever grow bored. I will testify a little bit today. We're going to get into more nitty gritty specifics kind of when we break off to guys and girls, but I'll share some of my testimony today. I have not always, I was raised up in the church, don't get me wrong, but I have not always known Jesus. There's a difference in just showing up and being at youth group and being there on Sunday and your parents following Jesus and slapping you with anointing oil at 3 a.m. and praying over you. It doesn't mean you're saved. And so I knew a lot about God but it was, I did not know God yet. And so there was a lot that life held before that great encounter. And I'll testify some to it because there is power in our testimonies. Uh, but at the same time, I loved what we were talking about earlier and just opening up for. Because I, I want to side note, caveat real quick. As we were praying and as they were imparting, open up, make room, release your expectations. I want to just acknowledge the parents in the room who showed up or who brought their young people. We've been ministering in this space of sex and sexuality and healing and wholeness for six years. Parents, rest assured, I've never once received an email or a note or a complaint of what was that? That was terrible. That was good. And that I was just thinking about that while we were down there. I'm like, this is a topic that could go a million different directions and that people could take a million different places. Praise God that we have never received some type of pushback because what was taught broke from the truth of the word. Yeah. And so I want to assure you and, and comfort you in that, that uh, what I have seen on the parenting front or where we've seen misses that could have been makes is where the parent preemptively was too afraid to bring their child into a space where these things were going to be discussed. Yeah. And so that's actually where we've seen more moments of like, oh, come on, that one hurt. That could have been something fruitful. But because there is generational shame, generational fear, yeah. there is confusion culturally, more of the misses have occurred because we've heard from people who are like, well, I, I don't know what you're planning on talking about, but my child's only in middle school and I don't want to put anything on their mind. And I'm like, lady, I was exposed to porn at nine years old. And so if you aren't cultivating conversations with your child in there in middle school, we may have already missed the mark. The average age of exposure to pornography, and that's just one piece in a big puzzle, uh, as of 2016, the average age was nine years old. I would imagine as technology has advanced, that average has become even younger because of just how much this space, this topic, this area, the enemy is intent in every avenue, in every lane he can to hit us, wound us, mark us, confuse us. And so... I'm grateful, parents, that you are here. I'm grateful, kids, that you rolled in with your parents. I see a couple groups here of that. 
Because the reality is that for us to truly walk in freedom, for us to walk in healing and in wholeness, we must obey the word of the Lord, which speaks to speaking of his ways, his heart, his law, as we rise and as we lie down, in our goings and in our comings. It's so interesting because we kind of get on the faith front that from the earliest age we should be laying the foundations in a way that our children can understand. But then when it comes to topics of sex or sexuality or, I mean, other topics that expand beyond that, we we wonder when and what do I say and how? And God's like, have I not instructed you to lay the foundations, to build as they grow, to be the source for your children of information, of understanding, of truth, because you are connected to the vine and they are clay in the potter's hands. We should be cultivating healthy conversations around sex and sexuality because at the end of the day, what they primarily root back to is our very identity in Christ. A lot of words to kick it off (laughs) and say, I'm glad you're here. I hope everything we're about to open up breaks from what you expected because the conversation in order for us to have revelation never starts nor sits at the symptomatic issues of sexual brokenness, of promiscuity, of pornography, all of those things we certainly can speak to. The word of God has much to say about every bit. But if we continue to shake our angry fists from a pulpit about the symptomatic responses and never speak to the wound at the heart level, we won't actually see freedom. And I can testify to this because like I said, I grew up in the church. I knew maybe the rule list from what I heard from my parents, from what they said in church, from what I thought I understood about following Jesus. And that still did not save me nor stop me from pushing the boundaries, from testing what was okay for me, for rationalizing. And I would feel a conviction and I'd think, okay, maybe this isn't best for me. The simple way to say it, I would take things piece by piece and maybe try to understand, okay, I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I should do differently. But there was never holistic heart transformation. So it became my best efforts at behavior modification because I said I was a Christian and because my family were Christians, so I just tried to modify my behavior, do the right thing. But that only led me down a slippery slope of actually just navigating the the gray area. Okay, how far is too far? Does this even count? Well, I can do these things in the darkness and no one knows. Well, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm doing this, but it's not hurting anybody else. So is it really sin? When we are living life trying to piece things together and trying to maybe fix elements in our own strength, component by component, we will still be just as fractured and broken, maybe even more so. But when we truly encounter Christ and have revelation of what he designed and what he intended, it actually transforms our hearts completely. And the question is no longer like, well, how far is too far? The question is, God, how close can I draw near to you? Because who you say I am and what you've said about me and what you've redeemed, this is too rich, too great. This is, what does the word of God say? That we are not to mock the cross. Wow, this is big. And so I want to open your eyes to that a bit today. And I'm going to use this handy teaching tool. Because there were seasons of my life where I tried piece by piece, component by component, to maybe do better, try harder, like I was saying. And then when God completely captured my heart and transformed me, and there was a holistic transformation, I realized that the the piece by piece elements may give us some answers and clarity, and they're important questions to ask. But when I had revelation of my true identity, What does the word of God say? When the Holy Spirit filled me, I needed not to be taught. That's what the word says. When the spirit is within you, you need not to be taught. Now, that's not... 
That's not dismantling the pastors, the teachers, the prophets, the apostles. No, no, no. All these things are good for the building of the body. But if we are dependent on them to just tell us, do this, don't do that, you've just fallen right back into religion. When you have revelation of your identity and you're filled with the spirit, you come out of religion and you start walking in the revelation of God and the revelation of your identity as a son or a daughter of the most high king and what that means to be adopted and allegiant to a kingdom. And so when we have this type of perspective, it shifts things, it shifts things. And so the coolest reality to even start with is the fact that we are a spiritual being created to know intimacy and oneness with God. That is the core foundation of your very identity. You are from before, even now, and forevermore spiritual in nature. And in this present moment, you're wrapped in a physical flesh. We know this from the word of God too. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Then God said, he's speaking to himself here, Father, Son, and Spirit. Let us make man, which the Hebrew translates uh, Adam here to mankind, in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Hear me so clearly. My daughter was making fun of me 30 minutes ago in that back room. She was preaching like her mommy, and she was doing this. I'm a hand talker. I will paint the picture with my hands. When God created, God is spirit, And when he created the heavens and the earth, when he spoke what was spiritual in nature, he fleshed out into physical form, right? And the epitome of his creation was man and woman, you and I. And this epitome of his creation was so special, so beautiful, because it was his very spiritual likeness put into flesh, and he first created man. Men, hear me when I say you carry the very DNA of your creator stamped into you. The way you are wired, the way that the godly masculinity rises in you, this was formed and fashioned to reflect the very likeness of our maker. And he saw that it was not good for man to be alone. And he brought forth from the rib of Adam, woman. And women, hear me so clearly when I say, your very design, you have the DNA of God Almighty stamped into you. You are an image bearing reflection. And together the fullness of God was displayed. His power, his gentleness, his strength, his tenderness, his mercy, his grace, his wisdom, his counsel. It was good. His creation was good. And he knew what he was doing when he wove you together. Very different, but together, this beautiful picture of the fullness of God's spirit made manifest. That's what he intended when he created you. When he created man and woman, it was a reflection of his own likeness. And in that scripture in Genesis, he immediately gave them instruction to reign and rule, to have dominion, to care. You were created not only to reflect his likeness, but to fulfill the assignment he has for you here on earth in his very character and nature and way that he would. He gave you and he gave me identity and purpose, form and function, correct? And it's cool because we see, I mean, just to reinforce that, John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth.
We are spiritual beings. Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord formed from the man of formed the man of dust from the ground. That's great. The physical form is great. But it says he breathed into his nostrils then the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. If someone has ever told you you're an accident, you're a cluster of cells, you're just here, you're just taking up space, you're just this, you're just that, you're just kid number four in the family, you're just, let every word curse and false identity fall off of you. Because God formed you in the natural for such a time as this. And by his spirit, breathe the breath of life into you that you are a spiritual being. Ecclesiastes reinforces this. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. And the dust, after we pass, returns to the earth as it was. And the spirit returns to God who gave it. So you are a spiritual being. And the perfect reflection that God gave us to understand the fullness of him indwelled in man was Jesus. John 1.14, he is the word of God in perfect inhabitation in human flesh. Colossians 1, 15 through 20, he is the visible image of the invisible God, for in him all the fullness of God indwelled. Here's what we understand, though. We are a spiritual being. So we're just going to put this here. But 1 Thessalonians 5 expands our understanding of our identity even further. So, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So just as God is three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit, so too his great creation made in his likeness, we are also three elements in one. Spirit, soul, and body. This is our physical form, our soul, our spiritual nature. Now, I'm just going to draw this here. It's laying down. We are dead in our transgressions. Here's your little spirit man. Your soul, the simplest way to explain it, encompasses your mind, your will, and your emotions. You can find a lot of scripture in the word to back all of these things. You can deep dive. I want you to get the framework because we have 40 minutes and you can study. Your body is your physical form, okay? So God created you, breathed in a very spirit into you. You are a spiritual being, and in accordance with the word of God, you are spirit, soul, and body, because the work of God is to sanctify us or transform us completely, spirit, soul, and body, yes? Yes. Now, here's the reality. I'm going to draw a visual. When my mentor taught me this, it was, I don't know if any of y'all are nerdy or geeky or like visuals, but it transformed things for me to understand what the Spirit had been saying to me all along, the Holy Spirit. And then when I saw it visually, I was like, oh, it makes so much sense. So, one of these, this is what I'm going to say, job, how do you spell receive? I before E, except after C, is to receive... (laughs) One job is to process, and one function is to express. Now, when we are born into iniquity, we already got generational curses tagged onto us. We are born in this fallen world that is presently ruled by the adversary. We are born in the flesh. We come into life. And the adversary's desire is that you would function this way. Okay? 
that what happens to you in the natural, this physical life here, me and you face to face, what happens to you in body, in the natural, would then, you would receive here, your soul would process that, and then it would be expressed in the spirit. So when we are born in iniquity, when we are enslaved to sin, when we live by the flesh, then everything that happens to us in the natural is how we receive information. It affects our mind, our will, and our emotions, and therefore it deeply affects how our spiritual life, right? And how we express ourselves spiritually. So I'm going to give you an example. My dad committed suicide when I was a freshman in college. That loss here, I I did not know Jesus yet. Again, I'd grown up, been in church my whole life. I did not have an intimate relationship with Jesus. I knew a lot of scripture. I could have told you a lot about the Bible. I did not know Jesus So when my dad committed suicide, the way that I processed mind, will, and emotions, oh my goodness, emotions you can only imagine. I yoked on, a spirit of suicide actually came upon me, which is just demonic attack. Would mess with my mind. I would hear voices constantly. You're going to take your own life too. If your daddy did it, you're going to do it. Mind was a mess. Emotions were all over the place, feeling hurt, rejection, abandonment, you name it. So my will, my decisions, what I did with my life were also informed by that physical instance that immediately brought pain here. And so in order to cope with that pain, I sought out sexual relationships. I would go out and party and drink, right? My will, what I chose to do was informed by the natural So all this is getting hurt and wounded, and as it went here, the spirit, don't even try to talk to me about a heavenly father. This father left us, forsook us, left us in turmoil, hurt us. So you're telling me a heavenly father loves me, wants to lead me, heal me, redeem me? Absolutely not. This processing center couldn't even receive truth. Does that make sense? So now let's think about, so my little spirit man, straight up, like just dead. In church, could tell you a lot about the Bible, could fake it with the best of them. My spirit man was dead. Let's inform, let's take an example sexually, because that's what we're digging into today. When I was exposed to pornography at nine years old, first time from my dad's own collection, started as overwhelming embarrassment. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My heart was going to pound out of my chest. Something was happening to me in the physical that something was set before my eyes. What does the word of God say? The eye is the lamp unto the body. Be careful what you set before your eyes. (laughs) If what you think you, oh, how does the scripture go? If what you think you have, like the light is actually darkness, then how deep that darkness is. So I was seeing porn, started to shame, quickly evolved to curiosity because I didn't say anything. I didn't reach out to anybody. It was just kind of my quiet thing. I started seeking this stuff out. Remember, my flesh is just being fully informed by the natural. I was lusting. I was longing for it. That progressed into starting to draw things. That progressed into other acts that brought my flesh pleasure when I wanted them. And it really became a carnal hunger that I thought was perfectly fine. Because I wasn't doing anything with anybody else. I'd made my virginity vow when I was younger, and so this was teaching me. That's what I would say. I'm learning about sex this way. These women, to me, seemed powerful. They seemed like, wow, this must be what is desired. I had a physical open door to pornography. As I processed it, my mind actually became consumed by these things. I was a kid. Some of y'all were younger than nine years old. 
when those things were first set before your eyes. Just as Jesus in his salvation is no respecter of persons, you best believe the enemy is no respecter of persons by way of your age, your socioeconomic, your race. He doesn't care. And the inroad that that brought plagued my mind. Porn was like sirens calling from the cliffs. That's the best visual I can give. Do y'all know what sirens are? They were these mythological creatures. They would call from the cliffs and sailors would see their beauty and would go and would crash in the rocks. Porn was like a sirens. It would literally call for me. And I would seek it out and it was continuing to just kill my spirit. Yoking all manner of perversion, sexual perversion, masturbation, false images. I'm just dehumanizing these people. It's, it's killing something in me to even humanizing others around me, okay? So my mind is plagued. My will, I have no control. The urges of my flesh, boom, I'm doing it. It's just me. I can satisfy whatever. The will was highly affected by what I wanted when I wanted it. And the emotions, um, I sure I wanted a boyfriend, but also there was this component of like, but that's also a lot and I don't really need it. Right? There's There's a layer that porn supplements human interaction and learning to love others as Christ would love, and learning how to even actually just healthfully interact, date, talk. I know that's radical, but y'all, when I was in the throes of this stuff, I didn't need anyone to call, just text, late night hookup, okay, when I got off to college, still, okay. I lost all dignity and value because my emotions were damaged by these reckless things set before my eyes. And so as I'm struggling with pornography, this is, again, one example of many, as it's affecting my mind, will, and emotions, as unclean, perverse spirits of sexual perversion are literally inhabiting me, my spirit, the way I perceived things with God, because remember, our spirit is made for intimacy with God. It's made to know how to have healthy intimacy with God. My spirit instead perceived, well, God, I want what I want when I want it. And so there was a performative nature that I sought from God. Well, make me feel good. Make me happy. Do what I want you to do. Do the miracle. Do the thing. Are you even God if you can't da-da-da-da-da-da-da? We become carnal even in our spiritual intimacy, intended intimacy with God. It becomes, I'll perform for me. There's no knowing how to have oneness with him. We don't even know how to have oneness with other people when we're addicted to that. And so it was wounding my spiritual understanding of God. Now, let's take one more example, and then I'll move forward. I want y'all to be able to fill in your own and do the puzzle work. Oh, wow, this happened to me. This is what it did to my soul. This is then how I perceived God. This is how the enemy wants us to operate. So... Uh, How far is too far? That led to me starting to push the envelope beyond porn. I started, again, what you set before your eyes forms your mind. I wanted the rush. I wanted the thrill. I start pushing the envelope, being physical with other people. So um, let's tack on, because when the Lord set me free and I began to break soul ties, there were four pages worth of names that the Lord brought to my mind of people I began to be sexually involved with people I would even lust after, men and women alike, people that I would covet, people that fill in the blank. The Lord says, if we even lust for another, we've committed adultery in the heart. So what celebrity lately have you been like, ah? Because that's even considered adultery. Well, I'm not married. It's actually being adulterous to him. So physically, over the course of time, while I still am saying, I'm a virgin, da 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 absolute hypocrite, lose my dad, sexual sin spikes, anything to fill the void, I'm with person after person after person after person. This is creating soul tie after soul tie after soul tie after soul tie. 
Because just as the word of God says, when two come together, two become one flesh. That's why it also goes on to say a man should not yoke himself with a prostitute. Why would we do these things when we are sexually involved with someone, whether you understand it, like it, believe it or not, you spiritually become involved with them in what was a good gift from God intended for covenant and what is a unifying gift intended for covenant and what is a vulnerable gift intended for covenant outside of covenant, the very thing that God gave us to be a sword in the spirit fighting to one flesh navigating unity becomes the very sword outside of covenant that stabs us. Whether you get it or not, every time you are sexually involved with someone outside of a covenant, you become one flesh and then in the breakup in the pain in the no text back in the ripping apart there are inevitably wounds and there are shards and when you were yoked to them it created a tie this is how 10 years later I could be and this is full transparency he loves me he's heard me talk about this stuff nobody get uncomfortable I could be laying next to my own loving wonderful amazing God fearing husband and plagued in my dreams sexually by past partners I didn't know our dreams had that meaning. I don't remember any of our dreams. It's the spirit realm alive. Read the scripture. God, the most frequent way he speaks to man in the word of God is through dreams. When your physical body is resting, there's still much going on. And I would be following Jesus filled with the spirit, laying next to my husband and get an attack in the night. How did that attack happen? Even though I'm filled with the spirit, even though I believe Jesus, it's because there would be something here that the door had never really been closed by sin. And so I get an onslaught out of the blue, wake up, drained, foggy, you name it, confused, disheartened. I'll show you how this all cleans itself up. But this is the reality when we function this way. So I'm sexually involved with someone. My mind's on him. Oh, I just, we tried to break up, but then he texted me, and then we went back, and then, oh, man, she's always on my mind, man. I'm trying to play football. And, you know, all I can think about is that. Your mind gets hijacked. Your will certainly gets hijacked. I know you've convicted me, Holy Spirit. I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't go back to them. I know they're not chasing after your heart. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> Your will, some of us can't even stand our ground when we've said for the 15th time, Lord, I am so sorry. You are still being merciful to me and convicting me of my sin and I feel it, I know it. But then something happens and we just can't help it. It's because your will is affected by sin. And our emotions, every love song, every movie you've ever seen is built upon wounded emotions. (laughs) And the hope of their restoration. The movies include all of this. They usually leave out this. (laughs) So these are just examples. And for example, then, when I was sexually involved with someone, it processes through here. All this stuff gets hurt. My spiritual comprehension is I have to perform for God. Maybe he'll leave too. God, am I doing enough? Have I, am, am, I, am I doing enough for you? Will you also leave just like that guy did? Will you also hurt me just like that guy did? The Lord is, is inviting us to be vulnerable before him, but we are scared. We've gotten hurt. We've gotten used. We've gotten abused. And so our spirit man still can't comprehend true intimacy with God. Now, here's the best part. While we were still sinners... Christ died for us. The very one who made you in his likeness knows what you're up against, knows what you've navigated, knows what you're addicted to, knows what you did last night, two nights ago, knows what you thumbed to on social media and what you're setting before your eyes, knows what's in your heart, knows every detail. And even in that condition, he died for you. When I encountered Christ... I was in a horrific car accident was the place I, I really was filled with the spirit of God. Y'all, 
My Jeep had flipped several times. I was upside down in this ravine. My phone, I could not find. I was literally hanging upside down by my seatbelt. It was dinging constantly with the text reminder that who I had previously been sexting, who I was going to get home and hook up with in Georgia, they had texted me back. So let's be clear, the condition Christ found me in, in the spirit, was enslaved in a brothel of sin. So we're intended to know intimacy and oneness with God. The invitation of the enemy is, it's your body, it's your life, it's your wants, do what you want, do what you please. Surely you won't die. And rather than this spiritual autonomy we think we're going to have, he actually traffics us into a brothel. The enemy is your pimp. And we take the bait and we get enslaved. Paul says you are enslaved to sin. And there's nothing we can do to get out of that condition apart from the grace of of God, apart from the work of Christ. So we went and we served one time in this... um, Lexington, Kentucky, Natalie's Sister Ministries, it's uh, positioned itself on the primary street for prostitution in Lexington, and they serve these women who are sex slaves and don't even realize it. I don't know what I was prepared for. I don't know what I was thinking. I think maybe because of movies, maybe because of porn, maybe because of the ways we just envision it. I expected the women to look some kind of way when they came up to get food, clothes, you know, whatever they need. Let me just be clear, they looked nothing like that. It was horrifying. Their condition was literally horrifying. And I couldn't in clear mind understand. I thought, Lord, if that was my condition, if that was the life I knew, and I knew this center was here, I would sprint into it and lock the door and cry out for help. These women did not. They would limp up or be driven up, even sometimes by their handlers. They would walk up in groups. They would get what they needed. Many were strung out. Many were so rail thin from drugs, they didn't even look human. They were dirty, and they thank you, thank you, thank you, and they'd walk right back into it. This is what it means to be enslaved, to not even have sight or understanding of your condition to not even have full revelation of the rescue that is there for you. And I asked the staff, what, can we abduct them? Like, <laughs> what? They don't understand. They could be free. And she said, we, the reason our ministry is even here is to build relationship to help them even see that they're enslaved. Yeah. You can't force them. Yes. And here's the deal, too. You might have been hurt by someone or wounded by someone sexually or physically and your will overrided. And the reality is that's wounded you to think too that God is going to force himself upon you, take what's good from you, make your life miserable, and then you'll be a good servant of God, right? No, 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 no. God will never force himself upon you. He has given you will to choose him. But the work that he did at the cross was sufficient was able, he holds the keys and all authority to bust down those brothel doors, to bust down those bars, and to reach into darkness and draw you out into his glorious light. He has done the work to rescue you and to draw you out. You have to take his hand. Mind you, I was in this condition, again, in church, knew the scriptures, could have told you a lot about God. This was still my spirit man's condition. And yet when I was in that accident, my phone dinging, the spirit of God came upon me so powerfully. How do you explain what is holy? It It opened my eyes in a way. It's like the Samaritan woman at the well. Like the woman caught red-handed to be stoned. My condition was suddenly very apparent to me. There was no more, well, it's my body and I'm in control and sexually da-da-da-da-da. There was no more. I saw my spiritual condition and his great hand of rescue. And I was overwhelmed by the love of God. 
How is it that you, in this condition, some of y'all are experts in talking yourself out of the grace of God. Because that was me too. I'm like, my phone is dinging somewhere in this car. Does he know? Yes, he's very aware. I had a four-page list a few years later when he opened my eyes to start breaking soul. Four pages of names. That was the condition he found me. And he rescued me. I took his hand. I want you. I need you. Let my life be gone. My life is yours. I couldn't believe his mercy. Some of y'all need to just realize your depravity so you can understand his mercy. We're so darn prideful. Some of us need to humble ourselves to realize just how broken, and that's not to sit up here and offend you. It's just to say, in my testimony, it was the revelation of my, of my depravity that opened my eyes to the goodness of his mercy. I was like, are you, are you positive? And he, had, he pulled me out of this condition, and he didn't say, all right, go clean yourself up. Go figure it out. Get in your bridal garments and then in that condition, he was like, I have a covenant of love I want to propose to you. You be mine. I'll be yours. And I'll make all things new. I was like, what is this? That is this. (laughs) And here's what's cool. When I said yes to Jesus in that car, I wasn't even discipled in anything Holy Spirit. My mom is filled with the Spirit, and she would talk to me about things as I was growing up, but there was no clear discipleship. It wasn't an element of the church we went to. It wasn't. I know that's a different culture here by the grace of God, but there are churches all throughout the South that act like the Holy Spirit is some gimpy third leg of God. Actually, they act like he's not even, there's nothing of the Holy Spirit anymore. There's no work. There's no, somehow, by his grace, in that car, I said not only yes to Jesus, I said, I want all of you, everything, everything you have, let all of me be gone. And I was filled by faith with the spirit of God, the fire baptism. So this is what this looks like. We say yes to the, the cross and we become filled by faith with the Holy Spirit. And God says, I want to teach you something. You've flowed this way your whole life. Come out of error. That's not my spirit who's led you that way. Your life is intended to flow like this. So first and foremost, in everything, this flips, flops. This is where we receive. This is still where we process. This is where we begin to express. When you have revelation that you are a spiritual being above all, wahoo! I've received, sorry, I have received Christ, I have been filled with the Holy Spirit, and my spirit man has been born again. I was dead in my sin and in my transgressions. But by your grace, through faith, I am saved. That's why he showed me that. While we were worshiping, oh, I'm about to get excited. While we were worshiping, (laughs) I saw a picture like an old wagon, like, you know, a cart on the back of a horse. But all I saw was the edge of the cart and a hand hanging from it, like a dead body was in the cart. And like the hand, it was a white man's hand for what it's worth. The three white men in this room were like, oh, God. (laughs) Here comes the prophetic word. (laughs) No, no, no. I I understand now (laughs) what I was perceiving. I was asking the Holy Spirit, what are you showing me? What are you showing me? It was being carted away. By the grace of God, it's because we are intended to have revelation. That the old 
<laughs> okay, here's deeper. It was being carted away, and then they were worshiping, and my spirit said, no, you sing a resurrection song. You sing a resurrection song. Sing a resurrection song to bring that body back to life. So as we were worshiping, I was just praying, Lord, let it be a resurrection song. Some of you need to hear the resurrection song of the Lord to understand you can be this in church, in youth group, by profession. Your lips profess me, but your heart is far from me. Then your spirit still looks like this. But a resurrection song of the Lord says, by your grace, through faith, I am filled with the Spirit of God, and I am born again. Remember when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, and, and he's like, you got to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, crawl back in my mom? What are you talking about? And he's like, no, you must understand, you must be spiritually born again. Because we're born like this, even though we're a spiritual being, it's like, what's his name in Lord of the Rings, Schmeagel or something? He's like, my precious, we're just sickly. <laughs> we're sickly, we're dead. <laughs> dead in our transgressions. But when we are filled with his spirit, we become born again. And when you get revelation of this, that's what I had my eyes open to in that wreckage. Whoa. I am a spiritual being, the very DNA of God stamped into me. This is my physical form intended to reflect that to the world around me. Oh, and also I don't have to do it alone. Praise be to God, because when I was steeped in religion, I was trying to do all these things in my own strength to be good enough. But by faith, I receive your Holy Spirit. And now intimacy with God begins to inform everything else in our life. So we're intended to know oneness with the spirit of God. Prayer room should be your first place. In the word is your bread of life. In the place of worship is your spirit crying out. Even I don't care if your flesh believes it or agrees with it or not. We worship because our spirit, our soul is exalting the Lord. Oneness here, you better be scared in a good way. I'll correct that. That was aggressive. The world, <laughs> the enemy should tremble at a spirit-filled believer of God. Because there is nothing that has happened in the physical now that he hasn't either informed me about in advance, that he hasn't equipped me how to handle, that he hasn't comforted me through, that he hasn't counseled me in how to walk in truth. And so when you are filled with the Spirit, all of hell should tremble that another one has defected from the kingdom of darkness, been adopted into the sonship, and is now walking in the full power of God. Now, if that is our truth, if that is the gospel that we preach, then this doesn't any longer look the same. It cannot. Yes. How you operate in the natural, yes. it, it literally can't look the same. Yes. If it does, it's because you're quenching the Holy Spirit. Wow. Yeah. If you have the Spirit, everything starts to change. And so the Holy Spirit begins to, what are his roles? He convicts us, yep. counsels us, comforts us, reminds us of everything Jesus taught. Side note, pre-Jesus, the grace of God was already at work in my life. And the grace of God, let's be clear, is already at work in your life. It's why you're even here. Whatever you came in carrying, the grace of God is needed for us to even understand and receive the grace of God. That's the real upside down of all of this is it's all truly about him. But when he would convict me, or when as his image-bearing creation, before I realized that, I would feel the pangs of consequence of sin, right? There was a pushing down of it. No, 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 it's just porn. I'm not even doing anything with anybody else. No, 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 it's just I'm alone. I know this is, I'm just carrying out these acts on my own. Oh, no, no, with that person. Well, he's my boyfriend, and we've been dating. Oh, no, this is teaching me how to be sexual godly. Oh, this movie is not that big of a deal. It's just entertainment. That's not real. When I got the spirit, I began to understand every pang of conviction is a mercy from God. 
You should rather the Holy Spirit convict you of sin now than Satan be able to accuse you at the day of judgment and be right. I'm going to repeat that because that's really important that we understand. You should welcome and be grateful for the Holy Spirit's conviction now so that you can apply the blood, be broken free, chains break off, walk in freedom. Let him convict you now and sanctify you completely, spirit, soul, and body, so that at the day of judgment, when the enemy comes with accusation, he won't be right. I thought this was a sex conference. We're getting there. Here is what happens. It's always going to be a gospel conference because a sex conference, go find any teacher, any, they think they're an expert, new way. I don't care. The gospel transforms the heart. And so we preach the gospel. So this happens. And as we start to follow this arrow, this flow, the Holy Spirit begins to heal our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions. The Holy Spirit begins to tend to, hey, do you remember, Mo, those 587 people? (laughs) I want you to bring every one of them to my throne and break the chain by way of forgiveness. Oh, I really don't want to. Yeah, even that one who hurt you and almost raped you alone in an apartment, even that one that you lusted after, even that one that you thought was your boyfriend, even those 15 that you were grieving and just hooking up, you're going to bring every one of them to my throne and I'm going to break the power that that sin holds. And those father wounds, I'm going to heal them. I'm your Abba Father. I won't leave you nor forsake you. I'm your protector and your provider. And that porn, I'm going to show you. Actually, he radically delivered me from pornography and masturbation because I I didn't even... Let me just set the stage so you all understand wherever you are, it's okay. When I first came to Christ, radical moment, filled with the fire of God, I didn't even make the connection point about porn being a bad thing yet. Wasn't even on my radar. It was such a part of my life It wasn't the first thing. In fact, he convicted me first about my sexual involvement with other people. I still didn't yet have conviction of porn. But my prayer was, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Bind my heart to thee. Give me eyes to see the world as you see it. Give me ears to hear the cry of the hurting. Make me more like Jesus. Make me more like you. Simplest prayer when I first came to believe. I want to be like you. You're amazing. I can't believe. Make me more like you. First time that urge to look at pornography came back, I didn't think twice. Went to my laptop, flipped it open, like muscle memory, navigated to the familiar site. For y'all now, it's one click on a phone. It's crazy. The instant that image came up on the computer, it was like my eyes burned. I thought I was going to vomit. Mind you, this had been rhythmic for me for 10 years. But the minute I saw it, the Holy Spirit said, all right, you said, give me eyes to see the world as you see it. I transplant. I I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I suddenly saw these people as image-bearing creations of God, not just body parts made for my pleasure. The Lord will rehumanize what Satan has sucked dry from your soul slammed it shut, cried out to God. It wasn't cute. It was not pretty. It was not, (laughs) like that's how intense. The real cries to the Lord, and some of y'all need to get even more undignified than you have ever been before the throne of grace. Because sometimes the spirit intercedes through us in groanings. And alone in a condo at LSU, one of the most sinful places potentially in the Southeast. Thank you so much. I'm getting finger oil all over the board, and I realize that is a sin when this is reused. I was delivered. Spirits of sexual perversion cast out in the name of Jesus. No fancy anything. A heart longing to be more like Jesus, and he said, then we have some soul cleanup to do. God wants to restore your soul. 
That's why the word speaks to the renewal of the mind. Your mind needs to be healed. If your arrow's going this way, he's going to tend to it. Your emotions need to be healed. I'm, I am not sure I've ever met anyone who has fully healed emotions yet, but many in the process of it. Every one of us needs our emotions healed. This is a layered work. I don't know how to... I, <clears throat> I grew up in a church, a church culture that was like, <laughs> you pray the prayer and just splash them with some water and once saved, always saved. Go live as you please. And I'm like, Donna, I'm afflicted by dreams in the night. <laughs> I'm a slave to my flesh. I can't stop watching pornography. I'm an excellent liar. All of these things are still my reality. And so me praying one time um, I don't know, maybe I need to go pray a second time, a third time. We end up being those church conference kids that come up every single time the altar call is made because we're like, maybe this one will stick. It's like we have to actually understand when we receive him by faith and we welcome all that he has, this becomes a lifelong journey of sanctification. Yes. Yes. It is work. Yes. It is work. Some of y'all aren't willing to do the work, so you're wounding the next person you're with, and they're having to do their own work after that. Yeah. Be still and know that he is God. Yeah. This can be a process. And I think oftentimes about when he's like reminding the disciples, hey, did you count the cost before you said you were going to follow me? Because this is a whole death to self. This is a pick up your cross and carry it. This is run the race to completion. This is a day in and day out choosing to abide with the spirit of God and yielding ourselves to be transformed. So it's not make me happier and your emotions are fully healed. It's a process. But he is faithful to begin or to bring to completion the good work that he began. And he wants to heal each of these things, ultimately to heal to our will. Yeah. That when that text comes in, our will yields to the Spirit of God. God. Oh, there's more for me. That when the urge of our flesh comes, our will fights the good fight in the prayer yeah. place and yields to the Spirit of God. That when our insecurities when our fears, when our shame seeks to boil up, we say, blood of Jesus, do what only you can do. And we apply it and we find freedom. The application of the blood, the yielding to the Holy Spirit, he restores our soul. Yes. But it's a daily choice to continue to abide. Yeah. And then when he sources us information and we receive. This has gotten quite messy. I'm sorry. Oops. Then when the Holy Spirit gives you a deposit, because I want to make something very clear here. You have an assignment from the Lord God Almighty on your life. Amen. You either hold a spiritual office or you carry gifts that were fashioned for you to operate in or he has calling and assignment that when his Holy Spirit gives you a word, it cannot be defiled by unhealed mind, will, and emotion. He'll speak a prophetic word to you, you won't deliver it. Wow. He'll minister something to you, you'll worry about what people are going to think. Your unhealed mind, will, and emotions will rob every jewel the Holy Spirit seeks to deposit in, into you. You won't obey him. Your mind will be tormented, still unsettled. You'll fear God in a way. What does he say that in intimacy with him, we won't stand before him on the day of judgment in fear. We will have been made perfect by his love. Your emotions, he wants to move through you that you would not fear man, that you would not be a slave to man, that you would not disobey him, that you would not get this glorious deposit and then the things and the people in your mind, some of y'all need deliverance in your mind, yeah. 
would not then cause you to drop the word he's given you. Some of y'all, the Lord has told you to do something, and the first thing you think of is like, oh, what, would, what would my mom think? What would Kristen do? What would the guys say? You need to get free of people in your mind. Because when the Lord tells you to do something, our worthy response should be, you tell me when. My life is yours. I will obey you. You need to break up with that girlfriend? Okay. You need to ask forgiveness? Apologize to your parents? Okay. You need to apologize to your child? Okay. We should flow in peace with the Spirit of God. But he has to tend to these things. We have to let him in the hidden place. So Jeremiah is going to come up and talk to you guys now too that as we have received Christ and been filled with the Spirit, particularly in the sexual space, what does that look like to process through and then be made manifest in our actions, in our words, in our lives? Um, but just to start off, kind of leading into what I want to share with you guys, and playing in, whoops, into what Mo shared too. We do too. this all the time. <laughs> um, Yesterday, you guys would not have recognized me. And in fact, Mo didn't recognize me when she came home from running her errands. I had a huge beard. We're talking like Duck Dynasty level. And by accident, my facial hair is this short today. I was just trying to trim it. And Mo came to the door. We were um, at her mom's house in Atlanta. And... She looked through the window, and she had this weird look on her face, and I had forgotten that I had shaved, and she was like, who is that? <laughs> and I answered the door, and she just looked at me like I was a total stranger. And <clears throat> just like when she came to Christ radically, when we truly have submitted to God and followed Jesus and make him Lord of our life, we should look different. We should look unrecognizable to the world. So I want to share some scripture and then just give you guys three different um, areas of life that this scripture kind of weaves into and just challenge you guys some. So the scripture, Mo, you can write it down for them. It's 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 20. It says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you, have, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So, we're going to weave that scripture in a few times to these things we talk about, but the first one is the company we keep. What company do we keep as believers? I'm going to share some testimony. When I first started college, I went to a school, and I lived with my brother, who was three years older than me, and some dear friends. That was my freshman year. Godly men. I did great. I was in church every Sunday. I was part of Bible studies. I didn't struggle with drinking, partying. It was great. After my freshman year, I transferred schools, and I got randomly placed with three other roommates, an atheist, an agnostic, and a Catholic. My two years were so different, purely based on who I was living with. The first few months that I lived with those other guys, I was good. I thought, I believe in Jesus. They know I'm a Christian. It's going to be fine. 
Fast forward six months, I was partying, I was sleeping around, I was getting drunk multiple times a week. It was a world of different, and it was all because I lived with different guys. My community was not with believers. I stopped going to church. I wasn't a part of any Bible study. So I want you guys to just think as, you know, there's high school students, there's older adults here. As you move into different areas of life, if you go off to college, your, your workspace, if you're not surrounding yourself with like-minded people, you're going to drift away from God. There's a reason the early church was so encouraged to live and do community together. It's because it was going to strengthen them. It was going to build them up. God did not want them to immediately just go out into the world. He wanted them to just really stay, get strong, build up their faith. And especially as we're young in our faith, you got to do the same. Um, another testimony involving Mo. When I first met Mo, I think it was maybe a week after we met, I went to Texas, to Dallas. We were in Atlanta. I went away to Dallas for a month. And I lived for that month, rough conditions, but it was for this job. And I lived with six other guys. None of them were believers. What we did in our spare time was we'd go out to eat, we'd go to bars, we'd hang out with other people we were doing this job with. Mo and I had just met, but we had talked and made it clear. We kept talking during that month that we wanted to pursue dating. But because the company I kept, the things we were doing, what I was around was not godly. By the end of that month, I kissed another girl. I started messing around with other people, but I was still talking to Mo. Thank God that she forgave me and could see through my foolishness and that there was a future. But again, I was surrounded by unbelievers, put myself in horrible situations, and there were consequences. So I want you guys to just think about what company do I keep? It doesn't mean you can't have unbelieving friends but that shouldn't be the circles that you're constantly with. We always think it's like missionary dating. It's almost like missionary friendships. You think you're going to have a greater influence on the unbeliever than they will on you, but that's typically not the case. A lot of people will even start dating unbelievers and think, oh, I'll be able to, you know, influence them and they'll come to Christ. That is so rare. It's unbelievably rare, and it's prideful. And Scripture says don't do it. (laughs) It says don't be unequally yoked with people in those intimate relationships. So I just challenge you guys to really reflect on the company you keep. doesn't mean you have to, you know, get rid of friendships or anything like that. But you got to surround yourself with like-minded people. Surround yourself with your church body. Okay? Second thing. Oh, can you write these down? There's just three things. So first one, company we keep. Second one is what are we putting before our eyes? The first thing people always think about is porn, and we'll probably get into that into the breakout sessions. Mo's book, which you guys all get a free copy of, we'll talk about that a lot. Um, And porn is destructive. I have two dear friends, brothers in Christ, but they still struggle with porn, and it affects their marriages. If you're struggling with porn, do everything you can to be free of it. That's all I'm going to say about porn. But I want you guys to think about, too, what you're putting before your eyes that might lead you down a darker path. It might, it might end up at porn. When Mo and I first got married, I kept watching certain shows. I kept playing certain video games until she was like, hey, what are you doing? You claim to be a Christ follower. Why are you watching that? Where does that lead your mind? There are so many shows, Netflix, HBO, Amazon, that interweave just garbage that we shouldn't even put before our eyes. It's it's corny and cheesy, (laughs) but what I started really praying and thinking about was Jesus If you were sitting next to me, would I be playing this game? Would I be putting on this show? It's corny, right? But it's true. There are so many shows 
my coworkers would talk about, my siblings would talk about. And I just had to go through a season of kind of feeling like, man, I'm missing out. I can't have these conversations with them. But it's worth it. I don't care anymore. That song, your way is better. His way is better. In eternity, God's not going to care about any of the shows I watched. (laughs) He's going to share about what I sacrificed for him. There's so much, guys, that our world just adores, but that Christ thinks is vile. Video games, social media. I got rid of all social media three or four years ago. I don't miss it. We still have social media for ministry purposes, but I would just challenge you guys even, maybe just for the summer, to kind of just cleanse yourself. Get rid of TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, any of those things. You guys, you'll go through some fear of missing out, FOMO, but in the end, you'll be so grateful, and you'll feel so free. (laughs) So I just challenge you guys to really look at what you're putting before your eyes. Um, Last thing, and... Any of this stuff, I know we're going to get into deeper in our our separate time we have um, with the boys and girls. But last thing is just relationships or singleness. Whatever season you're in, how do you view that? Um, The scripture, the the main point of the scripture that sticks, sticks out to me is verse 18. Flee sexual immorality. It could be with the shows. It could be in a dating relationship. If that sin is staring you in the face, the Bible doesn't say to just stand your ground and confront it. It says to flee. It says flee. Don't watch that show that has tons and tons of sexual content thinking, I'll be good. I just like it because of the story. This stuff doesn't affect me. It does affect you. Flee. Get rid of it. Go through your house, get rid of books, get rid of movies, get rid of games. If you're in a relationship that is filled with sexual promiscuity, if you're doing things in a dating relationship that you know you shouldn't, end it. Mo and I, (laughs) we went through seasons of impurity in our dating relationship in our, um, I wanted to say betrothal, (laughs) engagement. God convicted us, and we accelerated our wedding. Scripture says, flee from it, get married even. I've gotten rid of social media because I couldn't control myself. It's too distracting. It leads me down different paths I don't want to. You just have to eliminate things from your life. So I just challenge you in those three different areas, and we're going to be able to talk a lot more in our different groups. Um, But just know everyone in this room has your back. Parents, be open to conversations with your kids. What, three years ago, my mom wrote me and my siblings a letter basically apologizing for never having had any sort of conversations with us about her sexual past, about what to look for in spouses, about what to avoid in dating. She never talked to us about any of that stuff until we were married with kids. (laughs) And then she wrote a letter. But it was too late. Me Me and my brothers especially had gone through a lot of hardship because we we just lived <laughs> we lived that life so i just encourage you parents especially in this sort of setting have those conversations with your kids this is a safe place so i don't know if you want to close this up before we move on babe yeah well there's some scriptures that came to my mind um, even as he was speaking that the word of god is always going to be the sword that penetrates and brings things to life. I want to add to to one thing that he shared. As I was talking about this being a process of God convicting, healing, transforming, the more readily you allow this process, the more um, he can expedite in the timeline of your life 
you walking in the fullness of righteousness, of truth, right? And the more it saves you from. So as we even struggled in dating, it's not that when he said, really, the Bible gives us two options, flee or marry, right? If you can't, burning with lust, then marry. I need to be very clear on something. That does not mean we stand at the altar and say, I do, and suddenly everything's awesome. The sin that we continued to struggle in and navigating and our repentant being healed and stepping away from and the God's pulling back the layers, what we did choose to marry, but what had been done had to be healed and handled after we said, I do. And that's been a process and a journey that I praise God for his grace and his goodness, but I don't wish it upon others to carry in baggage that you then have to continue to heal from. It's not God's intent. It's not his desire for us. And so we continue to preach the gospel of truth as young as possible to understand this. Let him do this work that you might live things out in the natural in a way that is in his power right, and is in peace and in his righteousness. And I was just thinking about some of these scriptures that bring this spirit, soul, body element to life. Galatians 5, 16 through 17 says, but I say, walk by the spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. See, remember this arrow and this arrow. Start with this and you won't be lorded by this. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing things that you want to do. What this is saying is that if you're going to embrace this, live in revelation of this, walk by the spirit, armor up for battle. He's telling you about practical things to throw off. The word of God says that even as the gospel was preached, people would bring their witchcraft books and they burned them ablaze, right? In Acts, people will bring paraphernalia. People will bring the things because there is an understanding before we got into this place culturally of like, well, but also God knows my heart, but do you know his? Because if you know his, then we'll embrace what the people in Acts embraced, that anything set up as a stumbling block before us, anything that's going to aid the flesh in this battle with the spirit, we say be rid of it. He's not just sitting up here saying, here's a rule list, don't do this, don't do this. He's reiterating the word of God. Bad company corrupts good character. Watch what you set before your eyes. How do you view these things? It's important that we walk them out with God's view and righteousness. So that scripture reinforces it. Romans 12, 1 through 3. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed by this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your Mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. First Thessalonians 5.23, he wants to sanctify all of this completely. That we might receive, process, and express in a way that brings glory to God. But a part of that, and especially as you get to this natural layer, takes your decision and your intentionality too. So we want to pray and then we're going to break up into some smaller sessions. But we just thank you, Lord, for this time, for these components, even for your teaching, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for revelation that you seek to impart of who we were truly made to be. Let this temporary flesh form not rob us our inheritance. Let this temporary flesh form and the temptations of this world not undercut the anointing you intend to pour into our lives as your vessels. Lord, let the, the realities of the culture and the pressures of the world and the things that we've walked through or done or been a part of, Lord, let them not be our receiving formative impressions, God, but instead let intimacy with your Holy Spirit transform our lives. 
We are not defined by our circumstances, Lord. We're defined by the very work of the cross and the revelation of life by the Spirit. God, so I just pray the blood of Jesus over this space. Let all who the enemy right now is warring with condemnation in their minds, let them be free in Jesus' name. We speak no condemnation, God, but we do welcome you, Holy Spirit, to convict us. And as your voice of conviction has always sounded to me, it's an invitation to come back home, come back to your maker, come back to intimacy and oneness with the one who wants to know you and for you to know him. Lord, we receive your invitation, God. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. And we ask that the seeds would not fall on bad soil, but would take root and would grow up, Lord. That these young people's lives and hearts would be transformed, realizing they are yours. And their natural life is intended to reflect that. Lord, let this culture not form us nor confuse us or any flaming arrow of the evil one take ground. God, but let us be change agents because we are filled with your flame, your fire. We walk in a righteousness that sets itself apart, not in self-righteousness, but in the very righteousness and power of Christ that changes the environment around us. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.